Hi friends, in this video, we look at chemical reactions and equations. I'm going to show you the tips and tricks on how to write the reactions in chemistry. I'm sure by the end of the video, the concepts will be super clear to you. And do check out my website, manochaacademy.com. I have more courses and questions for you to practice. I'll put the link below. All right, let's get started. Here I have some pictures of changes in our everyday lives and you need to identify what are the physical and chemical changes here. So let's start with the first picture. Can you see that the person is cooking food here? So is that a physical or a chemical change? What do you think? That's right. It's a chemical change because you know, once the food is cooked, new substances are formed and it's irreversible. Now let's take a look at this next picture where you can see that the ice is melting. So what change is that? Is it physical or chemical? Correct. Melting of ice is a physical change. So I'll label it with P because you know that it's reversible and no new substance is formed. Ice just melts to water. Now let's take a look at the picture below here. So can you tell whether boiling of water, is that a physical or a chemical change? It's again a physical change because water changes into steam and it's reversible. Now let's look at this next picture. Here can you see rusting of iron is shown. So what change is that? Correct. It's a chemical change because a new substance is formed. Iron changes into rust and it's irreversible. Now, what about ripening of fruits? Is that physical or a chemical change? It's a chemical change again because new substances are formed when the fruit gets ripened and you can't get back the original form of the fruit. Now, what about the burning of the candle? This is an interesting example because when a candle burns, there is both a physical and a chemical change involved. So the burning of the candle is a chemical change but the melting of the wax here, can you see that the wax is melting? So that's a physical change. And when the candle burns, you know that it gets converted into carbon dioxide and water vapor. So we can say that this is both a physical and a chemical change, right? In this video, our focus will be on chemical changes. What is a chemical reaction? As you may know, in a chemical change, a chemical reaction takes place. So whenever there's a chemical change, there's a chemical reaction involved. Now, what is the definition of a chemical reaction? So as you can see here, a chemical reaction is a process in which new substances with new properties are formed. So the important thing is something new needs to be formed in a chemical reaction. But in a physical change, you know that no new substance is formed. Here we have some examples of chemical reactions. For example, hydrogen plus oxygen gives water. So can you see that water is the new substance formed from hydrogen and oxygen. Similarly, sodium and chlorine combine to give sodium chloride. So the new substance here is sodium chloride. There's something new formed from sodium and chlorine. And as you know, water has very different properties from hydrogen and oxygen, right? Hydrogen and oxygen are gases but water in its normal form is a liquid that we drink. And same way, a metal sodium combines with a poisonous gas to form sodium chloride. That's salt, which we eat every day. So that's the magic of chemistry, that in a chemical reaction, new substances with new properties are formed. Now let's talk about what are the substances on the left and right side of a chemical reaction known as. For example, when hydrogen and oxygen combine, they form water. So can you see the substances on the left are hydrogen and oxygen. And these are known as the reactants. Okay. So the substances on the left are called the reactants of the reaction. And what are the substances on the right called? That's correct. So all the substances produced on the right are known as products. Okay, so the left side is called reactants and the right side are known as products. 
Now let's take a look at this example. Can you identify that what are the reactants and products in this equation below? So you can see that iron is combining with sulfuric acid to produce iron sulfate and hydrogen. So what are the reactants here? It's iron and sulfuric acid. So these two are our reactants. And what are the products? Iron sulfate and hydrogen. Because what's formed is on the right hand side. So these are the reactants and products in this chemical reaction. When we write a chemical reaction like this, hydrogen plus oxygen gives water. This is known as a word equation because it's expressed in words. Now we're going to learn how to convert this into a chemical equation. So how do we convert a word equation to a chemical equation in chemistry? The important rule that we need to follow when converting a word equation to a chemical equation is that for the elements in the equation, we are going to use atomicity. Right? And I'll show you with an example why. And for compounds in the equation, we are going to use valency. Okay? So for elements, it's atomicity. And for compounds, valency. So what is hydrogen? Hydrogen is an element. Oxygen is an element in this equation. And water is the compound right so when expressing hydrogen we should not just write h that is the symbol of hydrogen so we have to use the symbol but we also need to use the atomicity of hydrogen why because we are going to represent each of these substances in its molecular form and one molecule of hydrogen is represented as h2 because the atomicity is 2 so remember we are representing one molecule of hydrogen here similarly Oxygen symbol is O. But what is one molecule of oxygen? It's O2. Because oxygen has an atomicity also of 2. And how do we represent water? You may know water's symbol is H2O, right? But why is that the symbol? Because hydrogen has a valency of 1 and oxygen has a valency of 2. So if you do a crisscross with the valency, you get H2O. So for compounds, we know that they com the elements combine according to the valency. So one molecule of water is represented by H2O. So what is the important thing here? All the substances we are converting into its molecular symbol. We are representing one molecule of it and for elements we are using atomicity and for compounds remember valency. Let's try this rule with the next equation which is sodium plus chlorine gives sodium chloride. Now sodium is an element. What is chlorine? That's also an element and sodium chloride is a compound. So for elements we use atomicity. So sodium symbol is Na you may know and what is the atomicity of sodium? That's right it's 1 because all metals have the atomicity of 1. Sodium is a metal and chlorine symbol is Cl and its atomicity is 2. So one molecule of chlorine is represented by Cl2 and since sodium chloride is a compound we need to use valency, right? So we know the valency of sodium is 1 and chlorine is 1. So if you do a crisscross, you're going to get the compound formula as NaCl, right? So that is the molecular formula of sodium chloride. So this is the important trick. Very simple to convert a word equation to a chemical equation. Write the molecular formula based on whether it's an element or a compound. Remember, for elements, use atomicity. And for compounds, use valency. Now you know how to convert a word equation to a chemical equation. Remember we saw this equation H2 plus O2 gives H2O. But is this equation completely correct? The answer is no. Because we need to balance this equation. This is an unbalanced equation. Now one question is why do we need to balance the equation? Because the chemical reactions obey the law of conservation of mass. That means mass cannot be created or destroyed. So it can't just get added or disappear in a chemical reaction. The mass of the reactants and the mass of the products should be equal after the chemical reaction. And so basically to satisfy the law of conservation of mass, we need to make sure that the number of atoms of each element is the same. So let's see, is this equation balanced or not? We look at the 
number of atoms of each element on the left side, that is on the reactants, and the right side, that is the products. So let me make two columns here, LHS and RHS, for the count of the atoms on the left and right hand side. And what are the elements involved in this reaction? So the elements are hydrogen and oxygen, right? So how many atoms of hydrogen are there on the left side? As you can see, there are two atoms. And how many atoms of hydrogen on the right side? Can you see it's H2. So that's two atoms. And how many oxygen atoms on the left side? It's two and one on the right side. So can you see that this equation is not balanced because the number of oxygen atoms on the left and right hand side are not same. Hydrogen is balanced but not oxygen. So we need to balance this equation and our goal is to make the number of atoms of each element same on the left and right hand side. So how do we do that? So one simple trick is go row by row, right? That is element by element. And since hydrogen is balanced, so we won't worry about it right now. Let's take a look at oxygen. Now, since oxygen is less on the right hand side, I need to multiply the number of oxygen atoms on the right side by two. So when I do two there, can you see? This is going to turn to two. So oxygen is balanced. But since now we have two water molecules, this is going to be four. Okay, so hydrogen is now unbalanced. So to balance hydrogen, what do we need to do? That's right, we need to multiply this thing by two. So you can't change the formula, you can only add multipliers in front of the substances. So in places like in front of hydrogen or oxygen or water. So now when I multiply that, this becomes four. Now is the equation balanced? Absolutely, because there are four hydrogen atoms on the left and four on the right. And oxygen you can see is two on the left and two on the right. So this equation is a nice balanced chemical equation. So remember our goal, you need to balance the number of atoms of each element on the left and right hand side. That is of the reactants and the products. Are you ready to try our next example, which is sodium plus chlorine gives sodium chloride. So let's check if this equation is balanced. Again, we'll make the columns elements left hand side and right hand side, right? And what are the elements here? The elements are sodium and chlorine. So how many atoms of sodium on the left? It's one as you can see. And how many atoms of uh, sodium on the right? Again one. And chlorine you can see has two atoms on the left and just one atom on the right. Okay, so is this equation balanced? No, because as you can see the chlorine atoms are not balanced. So we need to balance this equation. If it was balanced, then you don't need to do anything. So again, the trick to balancing is start with the element that's not balanced, right? And here you can see chlorine is not balanced. So to balance it, we need to multiply on the right by two. So that'll make it two here, right? Because we want uh, two chlorine since there are two on the left. And so chlorine gets balanced now, but we've disturbed sodium. Sodium becomes two. But not to worry, we can still uh, change the number of atoms of sodium and we are going to now multiply by 2 here so that sodium also gets balanced. Now can you see that this equation is balanced because we have 2 sodium on the left, 2 on the right and 2 chlorine on the left and 2 on the right, right? So this is a perfectly balanced chemical equation. And remember, you must always balance your chemical equations, never leave them unbalanced. Okay, here's our next example. Why don't you pause the video here and try balancing this yourself? So are you ready with your answer? Let's check your answer. For this chemical equation, I won't draw the columns. We'll try to do it mentally. So here you can see that iron is not balanced. Hydrogen seems to be balanced. There's two there and oxygen is not balanced. Okay, so let's start with oxygen first. To balance oxygen, we need to multiply by four because we want this four oxygen on the right and we have four on the left. So now how many hydrogen atoms are there on the left side? It's four into two, right? So that's four into two is eight. So to get that, I need to multiply by four here. So we'll have four into two, eight hydrogen also. So now oxygen is balanced, hydrogen is balanced 
and we're left with iron. Iron has three atoms on the right and only one on the left. So we are going to multiply by three. And can you see that's our balanced chemical equation. So I would encourage you to either use the table technique where you make this table of elements left hand side, right hand side. And this is especially useful when the equation is complicated and uh, it helps you break down the elements. And once you have a practice of this, you can try doing things mentally. So you can try to balance the equation without drawing the table. But if it gets difficult, always go back to the table. In this video, we balance simple equations. I'm going to show you some more balancing techniques in a separate video. So we've learned how to write chemical equations and how to balance them. Now let's learn how to write the physical states in a chemical equation. What are the important physical states? There's solid, which is represented by S. Then you have liquid, which is represented by L. We have gas, which is represented by G. And aqueous represented by AQ. So what is the difference between liquid and aqueous? Aqueous means dissolved in water. But liquid can mean either just water or it could be sodium chloride in its liquid, which is molten form. So aqueous means dissolved in water and liquid means the state of the substance is liquid. So let's add the physical state to this equation here. So we have hydrogen plus oxygen combines to give water. So we know hydrogen is a gas. So I'm going to write the physical state in bracket next to it. So G. Similarly, oxygen is a gas. So we're going to put G there. Now what physical state should we put for water? Normally hydrogen and oxygen burns to give us water vapor. And only when you cool it down, it converts to liquid water. So if you just burn hydrogen and oxygen, we're going to represent it with the gas because steam is formed. But if it was condensed to uh, liquid water, then we would have put L. So I'll just leave a G there. Now let's look at the next equation. So iron is definitely a solid here. It's a metal. And again here, the water which is used is steam. So iron reacts with steam. So this needs to be G. And we have triferric tetroxide form which is a solid and we know hydrogen is produced, which is a gas. So I've added the physical states of this equation. Now here's another example for you. Zinc reacts with hydrochloric acid to produce zinc chloride and hydrogen. So why don't you try adding the physical states of this equation? So let's see what should it be. Zinc is a metal, so it's a solid and hydrochloric acid is normally used in aqueous form. Because normally you know that acid is added to the water and the solution of hydrochloric acid is used. So that's why we have AQ here. What should be the physical state of the salt zinc chloride? You may be thinking solid because it's a salt, but zinc chloride is highly soluble in water. So we know, need to know about its solubility. And that's why we write AQ because this reaction is taking place in water. And hydrogen gas is produced. So we are going to use the symbol G. So as you can see, we need to write the physical states of the substances involved in the reaction. And for some of them, it's pretty simple like hydrogen, oxygen, we know it's a gas. Water is a tricky one because sometimes it could be liquid or it could be a, in steam form gas, right? And for things like sodium chloride, zinc chloride, if they're dissolved in water, then you need to write AQ. Otherwise, you'll write solid for them. So take care while writing the physical states of a chemical reaction. Now let's discuss the characteristics of chemical reactions. The important characteristics are change in state, change in color, evolution of a gas, change in temperature and formation of a precipitate. We'll discuss each of these characteristics with examples. Let's start with the first characteristic, which is change in state. For this, let's use the example of burning of a candle. Now, what is the change in state when a candle burns? As you know, a candle is made of wax, which is a solid. Now, when you burn the candle, we know that due to the heat, molten or liquid wax is produced, right? So this is liquid or molten wax. So can you see there's a change of state happening here? And when a candle burns, 
we know that gases are evolved so what gases are produced the candle burns to give carbon dioxide and water vapor and both of these are gas right so can you see the change in state happening in this burning of a candle the solid wax is giving liquid molten wax and it's producing gases carbon dioxide and water vapor so there's clearly change of state happening in this chemical reaction another characteristic of chemical reactions is the change in color for example when a tomato ripens it changes from green to red color let's look at the color change in this example so when citric acid reacts with potassium permanganate what is the color change we know that potassium permanganate has a purple color and when citric acid is added to it there's a chemical reaction that takes place and the solution becomes colorless so the change of color here is from purple to colorless so chemical reactions can have a change in color the third characteristic is evolution of a gas evolution means a gas is evolved it's produced so for example if you look at this reaction zinc reacts with hydrochloric acid to produce zinc chloride and hydrogen and as you can see hydrogen is the gas here so hydrogen gas is evolved in this reaction now let's try this next reaction so what happens when iron reacts with sulfuric acid so it's going to be similar to our previous reaction where zinc was reacting with hydrochloric acid so this metal will again react with the acid to produce ferrous sulfate and hydrogen gas is evolved so this reaction is also characterized by evolution of a gas which is hydrogen let's try this next example sodium carbonate reacts with dilute hydrochloric acid and what is going to be formed it's going to produce the salt sodium chloride water and carbon dioxide so what is the gas evolved here that's right it's carbon dioxide gas and you need to balance this equation so that's two there and two here and our equation now is balanced so in these three reactions that we saw here some gas was evolved the characteristic was evolution of a gas here's our fourth characteristic change in temperature so when quicklime reacts with water it produces slate lime and heat so heat is produced the temperature here increases so the characteristic is there's a change in temperature and you know how to represent this reaction so what is quicklime it's calcium oxide so that's cao right and it reacts with water to produce slate lime which is calcium hydroxide and heat is produced in the reaction so there's a change in temperature involved here and now for our final characteristic which is formation of a precipitate now do you know what is the meaning of the word precipitate it means that something insoluble in the solution is formed and usually our solvent is water so something which is insoluble in water so solid is produced which precipitates down it settles down because it is not soluble in the solution now let's look at our example here which is potassium iodide plus lead nitrate now do you know what does this reaction give us it's going to produce potassium nitrate and lead iodide now first let's go ahead and balance the reaction because don't forget to balance your reactions so it's going to be two here and two here so can you see that the reaction is balanced now and this reaction is done in water so the potassium nitrate that is formed is soluble so that's in aqua state but the lead iodide that is formed is a solid it's not soluble in water and it has a distinct yellow color so this is our precipitate which is formed i'm writing in short as ppt and it's yellow in color so this reaction forms a precipitate something which is insoluble in the solution now that we are done with the concepts i have a question for you so why don't you try to write the balanced chemical equation for the reaction below which is silver bromide in the presence of sunlight gives silver and bromine 
and also write down the physical states of the substances involved. So do let me know your answers by putting it in the comments below. I look forward to reading your comments. I also have a video on the different types of chemical reactions. So you can watch that next. I'll put the link in the description below. And do remember to like, comment and share out this video with your friends. And if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel already, hit the subscribe button right now. And do click on the notification bell to get notified about new videos. You can check my Facebook page and do check out my website manochaacademy.com for more courses and videos for you. I'll put the links below. Thanks for watching.